Today, as we come to the table, You've got programs for everything. This would be the church, the parking lot was full every Sunday. I mean, you couldn't, you're just coming in with your camel. You can't find one, right? There's not a spot where I get my camel in here filled with camels, right? Everybody's going to service, right? Because you couldn't get in. And you have to be thinking from the outside, now that's a happening church. And God is saying, you are doing a lot of things right. You are. He says, also, look at this, you've, pers you've persevered and you've had patience and you've labored for my namesake and you've not become weary. Way to go. Encouragement. Nevertheless, God will tell us, you're doing this, you're doing that. Hey, great, you're in fellowship today. Hey, you're doing this, you're reading your word, you're praying. Nevertheless. The size of a church doesn't always correlate to their health as the body of Christ. There are churches that are huge. They're bringing in thousands of people. They're putting on exciting services and maybe even making a positive difference in their community, but their hearts aren't growing closer to Jesus. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. As Pastor Mark examines today's message, he'll examine four of the seven churches that Jesus addresses in John's vision. They were his churches. He loved them dearly, just as he loves every church today, even those who have allowed false prophecy in. Because of that love, he brings truth to them, even when it hurts. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in Revelation chapter 2 as he begins his message, Jesus' message to the church. Open up your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. As we get today into the seven churches, now we're only going to cover four churches today. We'll get the next, the last three next week, and I think it's quite daunting already to cover four. There's so much I would love to talk about in these, and that's why I encourage you to go online to hear the full study that we did a few years back, more in-depth study, uh, looking at the churches and all that goes with it, at either pastormarkkirk.com or on our website or any number of great teachers that are out there that work through the book of Revelation. It's very, very uh, helpful in understanding not only the Bible, but the last days and what's happening. But as as we look at the seven churches today, there's some groundwork we need to lay before we jump into them, and that is this. This is Jesus' message to the church, but it's also his evaluation of the church. And you'll notice there's seven churches. The number seven in Scripture is the number of completion. And so what God is going to be doing here, what Jesus is doing, he's speaking to all of his church. And it's not just his church 2,000 years ago, as we said in the prayer. It's his church today. And what do I mean by that? This is God's word. It's alive and breathing. And you're going to find that all seven of these churches, they were literal churches that existed back then. But you're going to find that all of these seven churches exist in the world today. If you go back and look at churches around America, around the world, you'll find there's a church that fits in all these categories. There are churches that are being faithful, churches being unfaithful, churches that are stumbling, churches that are corrupt. All these things are there. Five out of the seven churches the Lord has something good to say, and then he gets into what they need to work on, and then of two of them, he has nothing good to say. And what a sad place to be in that state. What we want to do is say, God, which church are we? And we know where we want to be. Now, where we want to be, we won't get to until next week, and that is the faithful church, the church of Philadelphia, which even then we want to, again, we're not satisfied with where we are. God has to work in all the churches, and again, we hopefully that's where we are, and if we're not there working in that direction, I wouldn't be so boastful to say that we don't have our issues, but we have to be open and say, God, what do you want to change at Calvary Chapel in Knoxville? What do you want to change in our lives individually? What do you want to say to us? And so understand when he writes this, he's writing it to literal churches in that day, but they're also representation of the church as a whole throughout history. And by the way, speaking of that, as we look back now historically, we find out that the way the Holy Spirit wrote this, it's even prophetic. That is, each church era is represented by these seven churches. In the first church today, we'll get into Ephesus. That was the early church. That was the first church. That was the one that was the most on fire, but began to lose their love for the Lord. Then we move into the church of Smyrna. That is the church that came under great persecution. Then we move into the church of Pergamos, and we begin to see the church becoming kind of like the world, move on into church of Thyatira and becoming completely corrupt. And it'll work all the way through as to where the church went through different eras of church history. And if you look back at church history, it lines up perfectly with these seven churches. 
And that's why most theologians believe it's also prophetic. And I'm not a theologian, but I agree with them that this is prophetic of God's uh, work in church, in the church throughout history as well. There's another thing to realize about this, and that is you're going to see that uh, the, this church, again, the churches here were specifically laid out on a specific male route in the Roman day, and that is we'll start with Ephesus, and as you work around the churches, that's the way the Roman mailman would run, which I think is really cool because they would drop off the letters and move the letters from one church to the next as God wrote these letters to the churches. All the churches read the letters eventually. They were circulated, but they would be given to these initial churches or these, uh, these churches initially that God was specifically writing to them so they could hear what the correction was. Now, there's also something else. I love the way God does this, and we can learn from this when it comes to counseling. I think this is really important for a pastor. It's very important for anybody in counseling ministry, and it's really important for you when you're ministering to your friends and trying to encourage them in the word. They come to you and they say, hey, I've got this issue, what's going on? Or maybe even something you see in their life you need to correct. And he lays out a principle here because in all of these churches, what you're gonna see the Lord do, except for those he can't say anything good about, he starts off in every one of these telling them something good that they're doing. Hey, I noticed you're doing this, you're doing that, you're doing that, that is great, way to go. However, we have an issue, great wisdom. When it comes to counseling, you're speaking to someone or maybe a brother or sister that you need to kind of talk about because you see something in their life that's not consistent with, you know they're living a way they shouldn't live. You want to, listen, there's a reason the saying a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down, right? Because the principle is, is you want to be kind and loving and try to encourage and then say, now let's talk about some other issues. So there's wisdom here in the way we counsel as well. Hold on to that wisdom. Lastly, before we jump into this, Again, as we see the Lord addressing each of these churches, you're going to find that he addresses them with a very specific introduction that comes out of chapter 1. That is when the Lord revealed himself to John in chapter 1, he gave all these descriptors of who he was. I'm the one who holds the seven stars. I walk among the lampstands of the churches. I have eyes of fire. I've got feet of brass. I've got, he talks about all these descriptors that he had in chapter 1. And then what he does is he comes to each of these churches and, and takes the phrase that best applies to them and deals with it. What is my point for us? The Lord meets us where we are. And he this morning is gonna meet you where you are. If you need a spoonful of sugar and a little bit of maybe encouragement afterwards, that it's not quite as fun, he'll give you a lot of sugar this morning. He'll encourage you to say, no, but you know you need to deal with that. If you're just really in rebellion, he won't give as much sugar. He's gonna come in and say, you know what? Stop it. He'll be more direct. And we're going to see the churches that he's dealing with very specifically in his personality. Wherever we are, that's where he meets us. And so, again, having an open heart to the Lord and saying, God, do in me whatever you want. Say to me whatever you want. There's going to be a much more gentle approach. If we're stubborn in our heart, he'll come in and hit us more firmly. And it might be by something he says this morning. It might be by something that happens in your life. It might be someone else in your life that says something and you realize, oh, my goodness, why'd they say that? That's straight from God. Nobody could have known that. And you might not even tell him, but you walk away convicted. He'll meet us where we are. And he meets these seven churches where they are because he loves us. He wants us to be more like him. He wants us to grow and he wants us to be corrected. And so let's jump into this now. Chapter two is we kind of have this groundwork laid for the Lord now speaking to his churches throughout time at the moment of every generation. And then what he's going to say individually to our hearts this morning. Notice what he says. He first comes to the church of Ephesus. He says to the angel of the church of Ephesus. Again, remember, this was the early church, the one that was on fire at the beginning. And in one generation, we're going to see they veered off course. He says, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now there's his introduction from chapter one. What he's saying is, I hold the stars. Remember, we identified the, the, the messengers, if you will, the stars being the, the pastors of the churches. It literally, the angel of the church, when it says that, literally is the word messenger. And again, because of the context, the Lord is speaking to the pastors of the churches. And he's saying, hey, I'm speaking to you and I hold the pastors in my right hand. That's a comforting thing to know. And he said, I walk in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. That is representative of his spirit in the body of Christ. So what he's saying is, okay, pastor and church of Ephesus, I'm walking among you in my spirit and I'm going to say some things about you, but you need to listen up and you need to respond because if you don't, there's going to be consequences. So there's a warning here, but there's an encouragement. And as I said, first of all, he starts out with an encouragement, again, to this loveless church because they started out on fire. But again, it's interesting, one generation, by the way, quick note, it doesn't take but one generation for a people to fall away from the Lord, whether it be your kids or whether it be a nation. 
If we don't train the next generation up, they can fall away. And what's interesting in the wording here when he talks to the Ephesians, it gives a picture here of when he talks about them kind of falling away. Not that they just chose to walk away from God and to lose the love that they had. It was a slow drift that they barely even recognized until it was too late. It would be, imagine this, you, you tie up your boat, you've got the romantic picnic, right? And you tie your boat up because you just rode in with your sweetie and you dropped it off and you go and you go to get a, put the bank, put down your blanket, get all your stuff out for your picnic, but you didn't tie your boat down because the lake looks very calm. I mean, it's barely moving, right? And you enjoy each other's company so much that you're not even paying attention. An hour later, you look up and your boat's out in the middle of the lake, just kind of barely floating up. Oh my goodness, now what? Well, now you got to get wet. You got to jump in, go get it and bring it back. You didn't intend for your boat to float away, but because you weren't paying attention, because you didn't keep it tied in the spot it should have been, it's gone. That's the picture of the church of Ephesus. And it might be the picture of some of us this morning and where our hearts are. Maybe right now we're realizing, you know what? You're kind of speaking about me. I'm not really where I need it. I mean, I haven't walked away, but I, I, I guess I have drifted. I guess I'm not really where I used to be. And so it's time to come back. He says, I know your works. Again, here comes the sugar, right? I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. So you're doing good things. You're doing good works for me. You're working for me. You're very patient in the things of the Lord. You're standing against those that are evil. You're speaking the truth in the pulpit and among your people, regardless of what's around you. And he says, look at this. You've tested those who say they're apostles and are not, and you found them liars. Now, about apostles, we have an office of the prophet and we have a gift of prophecy. We have, I think, an office of an apostle and the gift of apostleship. And what do I mean by that? There aren't any office, office of a prophet such as Elijah's, Ezekiel's. They don't exist today. Why? Because they were needed before the Holy Spirit was given. Now every one of you have a prophet inside of you. He's called the Holy Spirit. You don't need some man to be the one that hears from God to tell you what God's saying. The Word of God tells you that. God will use pastors as they teach, but God can say it straight to your heart. So the office, if you will, the official position of a prophet is no longer needed. And Jesus himself confirmed that. He said, the law and the prophets were until John. He said, John was the last official prophet. And John was the greatest prophet that ever lived. However, the Bible speaks of a gift of prophecy in the New Testament. God still works through a gift of prophecy. It's just not the office of a prophet. Now, the Bible talks about the 12 apostles. And how do we know they're the official 12 that are, are the recognized apostles? Because when we get to the end of Revelation and we see the foundation of the new Jerusalem, guess whose names are written on the 12 foundations of the new Jerusalem? The names of the 12 apostles. Not 50 apostles, not 100, not 1,000, the 12. They're the ones written there. So there's a recognition that these have a specific a position that others don't have. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't with those with the gift of apostleship. And what do I mean by that? Because the Bible talks about that in the New Testament. The word apostle means sent one. And when you see somebody with that gift, it's typically the kind of person that travels around a lot from church to church, encouraging the body of Christ as they move around giving messages to different churches. I think Gail Irwin's a good example of that. Those of you that know Gail, he's not doing a lot now as he's gotten older, but he would travel around from church to church and he was sent, I believe, by the Lord to go and give messages to different churches. That's where that kind of apostleship comes in. And yet what was happening in this day was you had a lot of people traveling around claiming they were all apostles. And they would show up and use the word apostle as a way to get to your pocketbook. Oh, you, hey, I need a good meal tonight. I need a place to stay tonight. I'm an apostle. Let's take up an offering for my ministry, right? And so when that would happen, again, he said, you guys are recognizing these guys. You're recognizing that they're not real. You're recognizing they're phonies. You're very perceptive. So look at all the good things about them. You're working hard. You're patient. You're doing all this. You see things. You've got programs for everything. This would be the church. The parking lot was full every Sunday. I mean, you couldn't, you're just coming in with your camel. You can't find one, right? There's not a spot where I get my camel in here filled with camels, right? Everybody's going to service, right? Because you couldn't get in. And you have to be thinking from the outside, now that's a happening church. And God is saying, you are doing a lot of things right. You are. He says, also, look at this, you've, pers you've persevered and you've had patience and you've labored for my namesake and you've not become weary. Way to go. Encouragement. Nevertheless, God will tell us, you're doing this, you're doing that. Hey, great, you're in fellowship today. Hey, you're doing this, you're reading your word, you're praying. Nevertheless, are you really living for me? Are you allowing things in you should? Where's your heart for me? Do you desire me as much? Notice, here's their problem. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Notice they didn't lose it. They didn't lose their first love. They left it. 
And it's a picture of that neglect, of that drifting away. I don't think that even that they intended to do it. It just kind of happened. And notice the Lord didn't do it. They did it. They left. And it's the first love. He's saying, look, you're doing all these great works for the ministry. That's super. I love it. But it's about me. I want a relationship with you. I'm convinced that the Lord would rather have us sitting at his feet like Mary, loving him, hearing his word, having a relationship, than being all about the kitchen of the church, doing everything that needs to be done, busy, 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 busy. Okay, that's great. But Martha, calm down. It needs to, you know, get her done. I get that, right? You need to do it. But this is what matters to me, the relationship, the intimacy. And see, here's what he's saying. You've lost that. Quit, quit being so busy and get up early and just sit with me. Open my word and read my love letter to you. And let's share hearts together. Tell me your needs. Tell me what you're worried about. Give me your emotions. I want that. I want to hear it. I want to share in spirit with you. Do that. He's saying, that's what really matters to me. So he goes to the church and says, look, I don't care about all these things. I will get my work done, God will say, on the earth. Without you, without Calvary Knoxville, God will get his work done. Without any church in the world, God will get his work done. He's just allowing us to be a part of that work, which is a privilege. But he says, so don't worry so much about that. He said, just love me. And I'll love you. And as we love each other, you're going to see the work get done. Because motivation out of passion and love is much stronger than out of works and forced to do it. We don't do it because we have to. We do it because we get to. What an honor to love the Lord and to serve him. And so he's like, you've left. Now, the Lord would never tell us what has happened if he didn't tell us a way to fix it. And now in the next sentence, he tells us exactly how to fix it. Verse 5, he says, remember, therefore, from where you've fallen. Repent and do the first works. Notice that. Three things I want you to note here. If, you're, if you feel this morning God's saying to you, you've left your first love. You've let your heart grow cold. You're not really spending time with me anymore. You're busy. Maybe you're even involved in ministry, but there's no connection. It's like the relationship in marriage where everybody's doing their part. The dishes are getting done. The clothes are being done. The job's being worked at. The bills are being paid, but I don't know you anymore. What happened? We used to, couldn't, we couldn't do anything, but... We, it had to be together all the time. We talked for hours. We lived our life. Listen, all of us go through different phases of marriage. This happens to everyone. I think God allows that to give us a picture of what happens oftentimes as the believer with him. God is saying, hey, remember when we used to hang out all the time and we would talk forever and ever? We did everything together. You never went anywhere without your Bible and you were worshiping all the time. Where'd you go? I'm still here. I want you back. And here's how you do it. He said, Number one, remember. There's, there's three words I want you to note here. He says, remember, repent, and redo. Now he says do. I'm adding redo to help you remember it. Remember what it used to be like. You remember when you first met the Lord, how exciting? I'm forgiven. I get to go to heaven, all these things. He said, meditate on that for a while. He said, then look at your life, how you're not doing it, and repent. Turn back to start doing that again. And he said, once you do that, now once you've done those two things, do the third thing redo. Do what you used to do. Start reading your Bible again. Start praying again. Start worshiping again. Start getting involved in serving again. He says, let's kindle this relationship. Let's make this fire burn. God can revive it. God can restore our relationship to him. God can restore marriage. God can restore. If we say, I need you, God, my heart's dead. It's hardened. You've got to do a work. God will come and do that. And so he's saying to them, this plea from, from our heavenly husband to the church, do that. But then he gives the bad news, or else I will come to you quickly and I'll remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. His lampstand is the presence of his spirit. In chapter one, we see he said the lampstands were among the churches, the seven churches. It represents the Lord fueled by the oil of the Holy Spirit, lighting the church on fire and lighting our way. He says, if you keep in a state of, of non-love, if you, if you don't restore to me, he said, I just can't stay in that. I'm going to back away. And I don't think this is talking about a loss of salvation. That's not the point here. That's a whole other theological issue. This is just talking about him backing away, saying the intimacy's gone. The close relationship is gone. And I'm going to remove that lamp if you don't respond. Serious warning. I told you, God gives the sugar, but then he gives the, you know, the, 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 the shot as well you know, of, of healing of what we need. He says, but this you have. Now, I love this because now it gives some more encouragement, kind of this encouragement sandwich here. You got the encouragement at the beginning, kind of the, the bad news in the middle, and there at the end, some more encouragement. But this you have, 
that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which you also hate. This is interesting because Nico means to rule over. And, and most believe it has to do with the pastors or those ruling over the church. And the laity, laetans, comes from laity, which means the people. And when we look up what the deeds of the Nicolaitans were, this is where, again, it was beginning right here. It gets stronger as the church goes on, where the pastors and or the priests and or the leaders of the church start becoming an, a go-between between God and his people. God says, I don't want any go-betweens. I died on the cross and I tore that veil top to bottom so that anybody could come to me anytime and they don't have to go through anybody to get to me. And he said, I hate it. When somebody tells you they've got to go through you to get to that person, God says it more than once in, the church, in these churches. I mean, there's not a lot of things that God hates. He said, that, I hate it. It would be like our kids wanting to get to us and some adults between us and our kids saying, you can't talk to your parents. You just tell me what you want to know and I'll be the one that tells them everything. What? Grab that guy by the scruff and throw him out the back door. That's my child and I'm their father. Don't you get between us, nobody. Again, one mediator between God and man, and that's the man Christ Jesus. He said, I hate that. Verse seven, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is the midst of the paradise of the garden. There's a little bit of a thing that makes it more lively for the Ephesians, because this is where the Diana's temple was, which is one of the seven wonders of the world, and her symbol was a tree. There was a lot of environmental worship that went on, and her symbol was a tree, nature. Okay, and so he said, hey, I have the tree of life. That's the tree of death. You come to me, I'll give you the tree of life. That was in the, It's in the midst of the paradise of God. Same tree. Isn't it kind of cool to know the same tree that was in the Garden of Eden when the Lord comes back, there's going to be a, the, the tree of life here on the earth. We'll be able to partake of that when the Lord comes back. What's that going to be like? I don't know. I'm going to love it. But it's going to be great, whatever it is, because it's a, it's, a, it's a privilege to be able to do it. And so the loveless church, he deals with them. Now he comes to the next church in that male route, if you will, the persecuted church, the church of Smyrna. And again, the church historically, uh, the second church period where persecution kicked in, this is where as the church began to fall away and that first love began to fall away, uh, Nero raised up, the emperor of Rome, Domitian raised up, another emperor of Rome, and between the two of them killed some six million Christians during this era of time. So imagine if you were during this church period, this is the persecution church period. This is the crushing to the angel or the messenger of the church of Smyrna. Smyrna is where we get myrrh. Myrrh was an anointing for the dead. When Jesus, you know, they gave gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It represented his kingliness. It represented his fragrance of beauty. And the myrrh, the fact that he was going to die and resurrect. And the Lord's going to talk about death and resurrection. He's going to say, I know you're being killed. By the millions, I know you're dying. He said, but you trust in me. You put your hope in me. I'll take care of you. He says, these things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. Bam, there it is. The myrrh, the death coming back to life. He's taking out from chapter one and giving the introduction they need to hear. And the way you would get myrrh is by crushing it. You would crush it and get the oil of the myrrh that way. And he goes, I know you're being crushed. I know many of you are dying. I know this is happening, but I was crushed. And I died, but I resurrected. To him who was dead is now alive. To him who's the first and the last. He goes, that's me here. So this is the description. You have hope as well. I know your works. Now he gives them the good news again. I know your works, your tribulation and poverty. That isn't necessarily good news, but the works are. But you are rich. Again, why did they have poverty? Because this is also during this time where the Roman leaders started calling themselves gods. The New Testament letter of Revelation is a startling reminder that God's real and that He doesn't play around when it comes to people disobeying His commands because He wants the very best for them. Ultimately, Revelation touches on Christ's return and what it means for those who are followers of Jesus. If you aren't familiar with this kind of faith and are wondering what it means to become a follower of Jesus, don't hesitate to ask us any questions. You can connect at thewaymedia.net by clicking on the Come to the Table section or give our church office a call at 865 609 1385. Again, that's 865 609 1385. We'd be happy to talk with you and pray with you about anything that you've heard or having difficulty understanding. 
Revelation can be a confusing book to parse through, and we want to be here as a support for your questions and concerns. If you're in the Knoxville area, please come get to know us at Calvary Knoxville. Simply go to thewaymedia.net and find the Calvary Knoxville link to get service times and directions at the bottom of the homepage. If these teachings have been helpful for you or you'd like to hear more from this series in Revelation, we encourage you to find them on thewaymedia.net or download the Way Media app. God will speak to you every time you read His Word. Pastor Mark has more to share about what God is telling us in the book of Revelation. So join us here next time as we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.